Hello. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to be here and welcome you to the 31st International Material Research Congress. Please, we will ask the, the professors of the presidiums to take your place. Please. I really hope that you find this Congress very rewardable and you have a great experience scientifically and a friendly experience here in Cancun in Mexico. It is my pleasure to introduce you the people on, of the Presidium. We have uh, Maria Rincón from the Institute of Energías Renovables de la UNAM. Yu Shuing Shang from the Department of Medicine at the University of Harvard. <laughs> Sakira Albalushi from the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory at the University of California. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, wait, <laughs> not yet. Um, next, um, Jose Martin Herrera Ramirez from the Centro de Investigación de Materiales Avanzados. <laughs> Gerardo Cabañas, Chairs Coordinator. He is from... I'm sorry, he is from the Centro uh, of Materiales Avanzados, and the first speaker was from the uh, University of California, right? Yeah, yeah. okay. And next, we have uh, Cecilia Nogues, the Vice President of the SS Matter. Sabrina Sartori, President of the MRS. And finally, Jesus Gonzalez, President of the SS Matter. And now we will kindly ask uh, Sakira for some speakers uh, for welcome you. All right, so good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, so good evening, uh, my uh, distinguished uh, material scientist. Uh, my name is uh, Zach Albalushi. Uh, I'm a faculty member in material science and engineering at the University of California at Berkeley. And so it really gives me great pleasure uh, to stand here uh, in front of you as one of the co-chairs for this uh, International Materials Research uh, Congress here in uh, the vibrant city of Cancun. Uh, so uh, this is my first time in Cancun, and so Cancun is this really wonderful uh, uh, cultural uh, hub and wonderful beaches, of course, but it has now uh, become our uh, meeting place for uh, intellectual uh, and scholarly exchange of ideas. And so this uh, Materials Congress, uh, now uh, in its 31st uh, year, uh, really uh, realized this collaboration with the U.S. and uh, Mexican Material Research Society since 2008, and uh, continues to really bring researchers from around the world. And with this year, uh, we have 45 uh, countries representing uh, the uh, participants in this conference. So uh, I really, uh, it brings me really great joy to see such a diverse uh, representation in this Congress. And um, we have uh, people that are quite seasoned uh, in material science that have made uh, you know, many contributions, but 
we see a lot of young people and uh, a lot of eager people to you know, really uh, take a, a chance and, and, and do some really good research, and I, we hope to hear a lot of, from that. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of statistics. Um, and so we've have received uh, over uh, 2,900 abstracts to this conference. Uh, and these submissions uh, were across 43 uh, symposiums. And uh, this, these symposiums were put together by you know, roughly uh, 170 co-organizers who are really the heroes here, have really done uh, an amazing job and made the, the meeting chairs uh, jobs much easier. So I just want to give them a special thanks. And uh, I really think that the program is pretty exciting. And uh, we just concluded uh, 12 tutorials. And hopefully that was, uh, you know, you've attended those. But uh, we have upcoming uh, plenary sessions, the first by Nick uh, uh, Pappas that is happening uh, uh, very soon. Um, but we also have workshops, and as you can see on the outside, uh, 36 ex exhibits, and they will also hold six technical sessions, uh, and so hopefully you can attend. But more importantly, it's really your contributions, your uh, contributions and submissions. We have you know, 2,500 presentations. Roughly uh, 45 of those are oral, and you know, 55 are poster presentations, my favorite, actually. And really, I, you know, 2,000 of you are actually here on site. And so that's actually very wonderful to see, you know, uh, as we the world has recovered from uh, the pandemic. So I'm very personally excited to attend as many talks as I can to meet uh, a lot of you, either in person and virtually. But what I'd like to encourage you is to really, you know, engage in discussions, uh, really foster new collaborations, and use the beautiful beach here at Cancun to really bridge the gap between you know, your personal curiosity and you know, materials discovery. And so what I'd like to uh, conclude with is uh, you know, really to give a few thanks. Uh, first is to the staff, uh, and you see them around. Uh, you'll see them throughout the week. And uh, so they've been doing a lot of magic behind the scenes to really uh, provide you with this uh, you know, hopefully very good experience. I also would like to thank you know, the executive officers and the presidents of both the Mexican and the US Materials Research Society, but and also my uh, co-chairs. And so uh, just to uh, end, uh, you know, as we embark on this journey for the next few days, uh, hopefully we can remind ourselves of you know, the transformative power of material science and the profound uh, you know, impact of our collective knowledge uh, and hopefully shaping the world into a better place. So I'd like to uh, end by saying thank you uh, for participating and submitting uh, to this conference. And I hope to see you in the future years. And so with that, I hope you enjoy your time here. And uh, thank you for your attention. And I'd like to uh, uh, give uh, Sabrina uh, the current uh, MRS uh, president uh, from University of Oslo to give uh, her remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Zach, for uh, this uh, warm uh, welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm very happy to be here today uh, representing the Material Research Society at the opening of another exciting meeting. Our society is happy to be associated with this meeting here in Cancun and is pleased to enjoy continued collaboration with Sociedad Mexicana de Materiales, hope I said correctly, on this meeting and other activities and programs. Uh, we have said this many, many times before, but it continues to be true. Everyone at MRS, our leaders, members, volunteers, and staff, values the excellent and warm relationship that have developed with SM Matter. We hope to continue our collaborations to expand the impact of material research worldwide. Meetings like this allow us as a community to discuss key issues that will propel the field forward, re-engage with colleagues from around the world, and make new friends. In closing, I look forward to an engaging and inspiring meeting this week, and I offer you 
our best wishes for continued success. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. And now I will ask our president to give the, her, his works and uh, inaugurate this conference. Thank you, Mildred. Thank you very much to Zach and Sabrina for your nice words. And uh, well, it is my pleasure to be here inaugurating this uh, 31st edition of the International Material Congress. Of course, that I want to thank the people that is in the room, but also those who are uh, connected through the through the our virtual uh, platforms. Cordial greetings to the distinguished persons in the presidium in the honor line. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, but I want to do a special mention to Dr. Sabrina Sartori for being able to be here. I know that you did a lot of effort to come all the way from Sweden. And uh, you know she was very tired yesterday, but you know I see you now very, very, very good. And uh, well, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, grazie, 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 di tutto, di tutto, grazie di tutto. Anyway, so I also want to thank the four chairs, Mariana, Sack, Marina, sorry, Marina, Sack. Shrike, Martin, for the wonderful job that you have done, you know, putting up this uh, wonderful technical program. Gerardo Cabañas was a really nice, wise coordinator of the four uh, chairs. You know, I was in some of the sections that you had, and you really worked very, very hard. Thank you very much for that. To the plenary speakers, our so gratitude for sharing their vast knowledge in frontier uh, topics of the material fields. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Joan. Thanks, uh, Dr. Papas. Thanks, uh, Ben Kat, for your uh, accepting to be our uh, plenary speakers, speakers in this in this occasion. We like to thank the Material Research Society for its for its constant support, uh, which began in 2008, as Sacht already said, with signing the first agreement collaboration, being president of the MRS and the SM Matter, Christian Volkert and Juan Mendez Nonel, respectively. Without a doubt, a relationship that we started in those, in those years highlighted our society and also made the IMRC a world-class event in the field of materials. We are grateful for the financial support of our main sponsors, CONACYT, DEFCON, SIMBESTAP, UNAM, CONCITEC, QSM, American Concrete Institute, MarkTech, Holzing, among others. The IMRC is an event that aims to review current issues and future trends in materials, science, and engineering. The achievement of this goal is clearly reflected by the excellent, the excellent technical program that these four guys put together. Thank you very much again. Uh, I was going to share some numbers, but Sachs already did, so thank you very much, Sachs. And, you know, we have a, you know, we have a, certainly a good uh, participation of, of, of Mexican and many other people from, I, I don't remember, 40-some countries. So, so I think we're going to have a nice meeting this time. Um, and as you probably saw in our web uh, site, this Congress has two special events. One is called First Mexico-United States Workshop on Materials, which includes the participation of a group of prominent, prominent Mexican scientists residing or already citizens of the United States, and also a group of prominent Mexican scientists residing in the Mexican territory. The objective of this workshop is not only to review current issues in materials, but also to develop an agenda for future collaborations in material-related related areas between the Mexican community living in the United States and those who live in Mexico. We appreciate the effort of the two coordinators of the two, of the two shares, uh, Dr. Arturo Ponce from the San Antonio, UT San Antonio from, from the uh, American side, and Sergio Mejia from the Universidad Autónoma de Nuevo León on the Mexican side. The second 
event is the workshop called Mexico Accelerating Semiconductor Production and Applications. In this workshop, we have the participation of the Triple Helix, uh, companies from Mexico and United States, states such as Samsung, HP, QSM, government such as the state governments of Sonora, Durango, and Chihuahua, and also the academia represented by Arturo Ponce from UT San Antonio and Mark Madu from Monterrey Tech. Both outstanding academics with extensive working experience with semiconductor semiconductor industry. The objectives of this workshop are the following. First, to discuss business opportunities for Mexican companies in the semiconductor industry. Second, to learn about success stories of entrepreneurs in Mexico and in the United States in the semiconductor industry. And third, to learn about the efforts that some Mexican states are doing to establish indust industrial activities in the semiconductor industry. We appreciate the successful coordination of Dr. Israel Mejia, General Director of the company QSM Semiconductors. I can tell you that both events have attracted a great deal of, of attention. Now, <clears throat> I want to draw your attention to a very special moment uh, in which we will remember a very dear friend that recently passed away. I'm referring to Dr. Juan Mendez Nonel, president of this society. Uh, he died June 15th, last June 15th. Uh, but at first, I would like to thank Ana Partida Chavez, Juan's widow, for agreeing to be with us this time, this moment. And uh, we're gonna have a very short but very heartfelt tribute to your husband, Ana. So I would like you please to rise and you know, so that we can manifest, show our sympathy, our sympathy for your husband and you know, our sincere condolences for the death of your husband. Thank you very much, Anna, for being here. <laughs> and now we are gonna see a short video that shows some of the moments of Juan's uh, personal and professional life. As we will see in the video, Juan's generosity was always evident. He dedicated a large part of his professional career to generate conditions for, those, for others to be able to do the, 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 the work, they work. So now, can we show the, the video, please?
a las necesidades de la región en investigación, formación de recursos humanos y apoyo al sector productivo en el área de materiales cerámicos. Desde luego en México eh, se están haciendo esos esfuerzos, lo primero que se está haciendo es tratar de concientizar a los tomadores de decisión de que esta es una política pública adecuada y rápida si queremos eh, abatir los niveles de pobreza que hay en la sociedad, los, los niveles de, de desigualdad, eh, los niveles de, de economía eh, mejorada. ¿no? Thank you. 
Bueno, finally, let's proceed to the inauguration of the 31st edition of the International Material Congress, for which I'd like to have you stand up, rise, please. So being 7.30 of this evening, 13 of August 2023, it is my honor to declare this Congress officially open, wishing you that uh, you have a great deal of information into your heart and uh, also enjoy Cancun and uh, do networking as much as you can. So best wishes for, for the Congress and thank you very much for, for being in this edition of this Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we will move to our scientific program. I don't know, but they need to move these tables. Yeah. We will give five minutes for uh, uh, the step moving the tables, please. Please, everybody, can you just wait? We just uh, are waiting for uh, the remotion of the tables in order to start with the flare, first plenary speaker. Okay, now we are ready to continue. Please take your place. Now I kindly ask Professor Jacoman to introduce our first plenary speaker. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it is my pleasure, really. Uh, my name is Miguel Jose Yacaman, and it is my pleasure to introduce the first uh, plenary speaker of this Congress. And I don't think, I, I think it will be very difficult to find somebody more interesting and important to open this Congress, because no doubt uh, Dr. Nicolas Pepas is one of the most important scientists in the biomaterials area around the world who has done a tremendous impact in his work. Dr. Pepas is a, a Cochrane Regents uh, Chair of the University of Texas, Austin. He is part of three departments, biomedical engineer, and he was chair for a long time, and now director of the Institute of Research, chemical engineering department, when I had the pleasure to meet him, I'm from now the newly formed uh, medicine school in the University of Texas. Uh, uh, I, I will not, uh, I, I will really ask you to read in the program all his achievements and all his uh, 
uh, uh, accomplishments because it's too long. It will take me as long as the conference to just describe them. I, I just remarked that uh, he has around 1,700 publications, which is really remarkable, close to 200,000 citations. Uh, and then, besides being a great scientist, he's also a great entrepreneur. He has patents, he has started uh, companies, and uh, I would say he's uh, one of the uh, few uh, scientists in the United States which is member of two of the national academies, which, as you know, is the most important distinction for a scientist in the United States, besides the other academies around the world. He's member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine, and, and many other distinguished. And, but please read the CV, but I just like to add a personal note to this introduction. When I was uh, working at the University of Texas in the Chemical Engineering Department, Dr. Pepas was appointed. He came from Purdue, uh, Purdue University, and you immediately feel the presence of Nicholas, his uh, drive, his force. He was always pushing new projects, pushing, uh, making criticism the most positive way. And really, he made a tremendous impact on, on the University of Texas and, and, and the scientific establishment. And I was very impressed with him. But I'd like to add another thing that's very important, especially for the young people. Dr. Pepas is a great scientist, no doubt about it, but he's also a gentleman and a great person and a great colleague. And these are two qualities that sometimes, unfortunately, do not come together. That's why I, I have the enormous pleasure to introduce Professor Pepas to Gilbert. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you very much, Miguel. This is a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here today. I want to thank the organizing committee of the, this Congress, a very, very well-known Congress, uh, especially Jesus. My God, your introduction was incredible. And it shows all of us how we can be scientists and can be humans at the same time. I want to thank Sabrina Sartori. This is very important to me. Here's an Italian who works in Norway and she's the incoming president of MRS. Uh, that shows you how the world has changed. We don't have barriers anymore. We are all together. I want to thank also Shrike Zhang because without him probably I wouldn't be here. Thank you for your support all this time. This is my seventh or eighth time in Mexico. Only one time I came for vacation in this place, a little bit south in Playa de Carmen. It was not a very good vacation. <laughs> All the other times have been for research. Interactions with Autonoma, the Mexico City, interactions with Tecnológico de Monterrey, with Nuevo León, with Aguas Calientes, uh, and also with individual places in Matamoros and Puerto Vallarta and so on. Damas y caballeros, I wanted to give my talk in Spanish. I prepared it. My Spanish students read it. They said it was very good, but then I said there are, there are also some gringos in the audience, so, <laughs> so we better give it in English. I have three goals today. One goal is to point out how materials and material science and the fundamentals of materials continue to be a cornerstone, cornerstone of what we are doing. I've been a member of MRS for, I don't remember, 40 years, and of course fellow and so on. The second thing is to point out that the biomedical field, the biomedical applications are important and that all of us who work in material science should be trying to work in that area. The third thing is to talk to the young generation. And I allow you to come and interrupt me anytime you want tonight or tomorrow or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday when I'm leaving and we can take pictures together and of course, I tell you, they're going to go on Twitter because many of you recognize that I am very, very active on Twitter and LinkedIn. But let's talk a little bit about the subject I want to cover today. I want to talk about advances in materials, 
molecular recognition and, ther and thermodynamic response. The days, I came to the United States from Greece, estoy griego, griego americano, okay? I, I came from the United, to the United States in July of 1971. I had no idea what bio was, except for something that had happened in my life. I wanted to do materials and return to Greece for materials. The world has changed. In 1971, we were grabbing whatever was available and saying, well, this looks like a good material to use in a medical application. Nothing else. We were doing some toxicity studies a year later after the first patients had died, or after the first animals had died, unfortunately. The world has changed. Look at what I have up there. Now, most of these developments are based on really a good understanding of molecular structure of materials, their interactions with the biological system, the fact that we can have intracellular transport interaction with cells and so on, and I want to go very fast to the last line that is in yellow. Our ability now to use materials to recognize that something has happened in the body, send the information to some kind of a station, maybe a wristwatch, and from the wristwatch to the doctor's office, and then try to come up with an immediate answer and an immediate solution. And especially I talk to the young generation, to the PhDs and to the masters. Don't listen to the old timers. The solutions we have right now with materials in our field are not the best solutions. And for, don't forget something else. What you're developing is not only for Mexico. It's not only for the United States. It's also for Paraguay and Bolivia. And it is for Guyana. And it is for all the African countries that don't have a lot of money. Do you realize that the annual budget per Patient in Mozambique is $9 a year. What can you do with $9 a year? So really, we need to change the way we think. And what we develop, we have to make sure it applies everywhere. That's called convergence, bringing together knowledge from different areas to come up with one final solution. When you look at everything that I'm going to tell you in a few minutes, you will see two major things. One is, I'm going to be working about with intelligent materials, intelligent biomaterials, and the other one with nanoscale structures. Now, when I hear intelligent materials, some people are leaving the audience already because they say, what is this to do with materials? Intelligence is nothing else than thermodynamic interaction with the environment, with the surrounding system. All of us know thermodynamics. We know good thermodynamics. We know thermodynamics that is for non-ideal systems, but we just don't know how to apply it. And this becomes very obvious here. Very often people say, how did you start in the field? I was a chemical engineer. I was a sophomore up in the columns in Rotterdam working for the company Shell. Sophomore means second year. Eh? Uh, for a company Shell in 1967. And I returned home and I heard on the radio, we didn't have television, that some crazy medical doctor at the Grotte Sur in Cape Town had done the first heart transplant. Are you kidding me? What did he do? He cut the heart of Arshamsky, he put it aside, and he brought another heart and he put it in it. That must be engineering. I was afraid of blood, but you know, I wanted to work on it. And I started really looking at it, and I did immediately the first studies. This is Christian Barnard, he is not with us anymore. But as you can imagine, 55 years ago, he was really one of the major, major figures that all of us who were scientists would try to emulate. And this started me in that particular area. One area that I want to talk to you about today is one type of materials called hydrogels, networks, cross-link networks. And I know many of you in the audience are here because you, you want to hear the latest. Networks and hydrogels is a very important field. I'll tell you something, in 1971, when I started working on hydrogels, the field was almost dead. People had no idea what it was. I remember a very distinguished colleague and friend now at Caltech who came to my office and he said, what is this you are working on? This is not engineering, this is something else. This was the response of people to that area. Today, please open science or nature and you will see one quarter of the papers 
talk about gels, soft matter, that can be used for this application, that application, the other application. And what do they study? The structure. So 50 years later, we still don't understand the structure of many of these materials. If you look at the history, and I happen to be also a little bit of an amateur historian, you will see that the gel started in the 30s, mostly in Germany, with hydrocolloids and so on. Actually, some of the students of Hermann Staudinger were really the ones who pushed this basic idea. But it was really in the early 40s and with Paul Flory, who I happen to have him in my PhD thesis as a, as a member of the committee at MIT. He was at MIT for a year. And Paul Flory was the first one who came up with the analysis of networks and the first understanding of statistical mechanics, molecular structure, thermodynamics, and so on. Several others. If any one of you ever followed the Soviet literature, Nikolai Plate, Kargin, and many, many others. And an incredible Japanese, Ichiro Sakurada, who was a student of Hermann Starniger, worked there for a few, a few years, and then returned back to Japan. And he worked for Japan before World War II and during World War II. And after that, he became the director of the Kyoto Institute that many of us know that is very important. Where is the materials, the biomaterials application? 1959-1960. Otto Wichterle, a Czech, not German, although the name sounds German, a Czech was the first one who took polyhydroxyethyl methacrylate, cross-linked it, came up with a material that would absorb on the average 40% water at 37 degrees, at 34 degrees, which is the temperature of the eye, and used it in the first soft contact lenses. And that is the beginning of a new generation of scientists working in this field. This is Otto Victorle, and I just want you to see the name. The man lived a very, a very, very uh, good life and helped a lot of things. And those of you who are old timers, who were in Europe in the 70s and 80s and 90s, you remember that Prague had one of the most important uh, macromolecular institutes in the world at that time. But this is Paul Flory. And Paul Flory was the first one who, with a limited knowledge of computers of those days, was able to start calculating statistical mechanics and calculating the structure of chains in Gaussian or non-Gaussian distribution. And he did that because he wanted to understand network structures. And that, of course, eventually became hydrogen structures. It's very important to see that one very important parameter in this network structure is the, consecutive, the distance between two consecutive crosslinks. And I will use here the word crosslinks in a more general way. I don't mean only covalent crosslinks. Some of them may be ionic crosslinks. Some of them may be simply entanglements that happen not to disentangle. The important thing is what is the distance. If you go to the very preliminary ideas of Flory in the 50s, you can calculate an end-to-end -end distance, a mesh size, as I was calling it for a very long time, that is really a characteristic of the structure. Now, many of you will say, why is that important? In my biomedical applications that I'm about to introduce, this is very important because it gives you an idea of the open network structure through which different small molecules, large molecules, proteins, peptides, antibodies, and so on can penetrate. So it becomes a very important part. And there's no doubt that you can see many people in the field who say, well, you know, we did a 2% cross-linking and this is the material. I do not question their comments. But I say, as a material scientist, I want to go one step further. And I'm pretty sure all of you want to go one step further. Spend six months, a year, two years, to learn the structure of these new materials. And you can see, of course, that this end-to-end -end distance becomes a very important parameter, this Xi. And those of you who are interested, I don't have it in my slides, we have a new website called www.hydrogeldesign, no space, hydrogeldesign.org. Uh, if you go into it, you're going to be absolutely fascinated. We have really redone the whole theories of networks, applications, how we can do studies, experimental studies, and so on. It's a wonderful way of analyzing network structures for any type of network, because it's not only tetrafunctional networks. 
but multifunctional networks as again. This is something that I submitted about 35 years ago in the Journal of Polymer Science. And it was saying, look, there, is, there are chains that are moving around. There is an available space. Uh, okay, And you could calculate using especially the Jean theories, which were very, very powerful powerful in the early 90s, you could calculate the available size for that network through which passage could happen. But then we realized that there were large proteins that were penetrating. How was a large protein penetrating through this network? And that led to the ideas of reptation and so on. Uh, one last thing, uh, a little bit of a personal uh, uh, advertisement, is this book. This book I started writing when I was very young. I was full professor, but I was my early years, maybe nine years at Purdue University. I originally, it was supposed to be one volume. It became three volumes, something like 700 pages. And surprisingly enough, 30 years later, it's still considered a very nice book to follow. And actually, you can see it in blue. Recently, CRC Press reprinted it and so on. It's there for students to learn. So what do we do now? We take these materials, which are soft matter, we take them either in equilibrated state with water or with biological fluids, or sometimes without water but still cross-linked, and we study interactions with the surrounding environment. What are we interested in? Number one, pH change. pH sensitivity is a very important thing. Number two, temperature change. We know that many of these polymeric materials are temperature sensitive because of critical conditions. Can we use that to our advantage, especially when we translate to the industrial environment, when we try to take these ideas and put them in a product that patients would use? Then we started looking at electrical fields. We started looking at magnetic fields and so on. And this is really a summary of what I still do. Uh, the results can be in specific fields for specific applications. The challenges are how to apply these networks to various types of diseases. Because I forgot to tell you, I am not satisfied, and my students are not satisfied with just simply doing the fundamental work. If you go and see our publications, you will see there is always a hint in an application. Because I strongly believe that the taxpayers of Mexico, the taxpayers of Texas, the taxpayers of the United States, do not care how many publications you publish and how many citations you have. They care about your solving their problems. And it is you graduate students that need to solve the problems. Don't expect us, the old timers, to do that. We gave you the background. We are giving you the background. Please use it to come up with something better for Mexico, for something better for the United States. And I am serious about it. Have a goal in life. Don't stop working. Don't stop thinking of all the poor people that could be saved because you took a, a material, a network, or something, and you applied a magnetic field, and you translated it into a biosensor that can be used for a very important application. I have three things that I wanted to discuss with you very briefly not in a big extent. One is, of course, the biomimetics, because I wanted to see how we do molecular recognition. The second is the oral delivery of certain types of large proteins. How do you treat an autoimmune disease? How do you treat people who have multiple sclerosis? Don't tell me it's easy. No, it's not. On December 25th, 1991, I started having double vision. Three days later, I went to a doctor, and the doctor diagnosed that I had multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis. I was newly wed. We didn't have children. That was the end of my life. That was the end of all patients' life. You know how many women develop multiple sclerosis at the age of 30 and 35? Do you know how many social catastrophes? Do you know how many are abandoned by their fiancés because they don't want to be with a woman that is I don't know what, and so on. And I started working on multiple sclerosis. I was taking once a week an interferon beta product. You know what it is? It's an injection. Not your little injections that you have in insulin. 
We're taking an injection down here and there and there and there, straight down. Intramuscular injection, it hurts. I could do injections to apples and oranges, believe me. I just couldn't do it to myself. And then you do it one Friday, the next Friday you have a scar tissue. So it hurts, and it hurts more and more and more. And that's where we started really developing new systems where we said, we are going to take these nanogels and nanoparticles, but we are going to put in them interferon beta because that was the specific drug at that time. And we're going to deliver the interferon beta, not by intramuscular injection, but by oral delivery. Do you know how difficult that is? Interferon beta has a very small window where it is uh, natural. I mean, you know, it's not, de it's not uh, denatured. So really, how do you achieve that? And this became eventually a very big story. I don't want to keep you waiting what happened to me because, thank God, 31 years later, you see me still walking. It was discovered about 15 years later that the doctors had made a mistake. I had been misdiagnosed with multiple sclerosis. But I often think that perhaps this was a divine intervention, a divine providence to make me work in that disease, which I would have never worked on before. Anyhow, so much for that. Don't tell me that there are easy solutions. There are not. People are dying, they suffer, and we need to do better for that. And you know something? Biopolymers, biomaterials, biohydrogels can give us a solution to many of those things. So at that time, I started working actually more recently at the University of Texas with a number of brilliant scientists. One of them is John Clegg, who is now at the University of Oklahoma. Another one is Marisa Wexler. You will see her here tomorrow, University of Texas at San Antonio, who had one very nice idea. Can we imprint the structure of an undesirable compound in a polymer, in a network, and use that to attract the information, start the process of delivery, and eventually perhaps degradation. Very difficult to do. All those of you who are chemical engineers, you start thinking of binding and catalysis. This is not catalysis. I'm talking about being able to recognize that there is glucose passing by at a distance of five angstrom, not next to you, at a distance of five angstrom and recognize glucose and not galactose, have the ability to have that specificity. Well, we have been able to do it. But there is one major problem. If you take nanoparticles of all these nicely cross-linked systems and use them for it, you have one huge problem, the diffusional limitation. How is this nanoparticle going to recognize what happens in the surrounding system? It needs some time to come all, for the information to come to the center. So what we started doing is what you see over here. We have only the surface recognitive. The rest of the material doesn't have to be recognitive. And there are many publications, and you can go to Google Scholar, or I think some of them are mentioned here about how we did that. Uh, this is on the left, Heidi Calder. On the right, of course, is John uh, Clegg. And the idea is an ingenious idea. You do a reaction with monomers around a particular template, as we call it, a particular undesirable compound. You close it. You form a reaction very fast. You do it usually under nitrogen, under very well-controlled conditions. And you have now what you see on the right side. And then you wash it in the worst possible way to remove the template. And you are left with just the nanocavity that has the ability, hopefully, to recognize exactly the same monomer. And this was the idea of mimetics, of molecular recognition. Started about 20 years ago. In the last few years, it has uh, gone very, very much better. You will meet Marisa Wexler tomorrow. She's the one that you see here. You can see the system starting from the upper left side and going to the right and then down and so on. And you can see the system can now have a nanocavity. It's a material that has a nanocavity. It's well controlled during a preparation. And that nanocavity can recognize exactly 
<coughs> what you had used as a template at the very beginning. Very easy to say all these things, very difficult to do them. And don't forget, you work in the laboratory, you do all the studies in deionized water at a certain pH, and then you say, translation, I'm going to use them now in a patient. Are you kidding me? There are a hundred different proteins and lipids and so on, which are going to be competing with what you have. So really, we have a very, very detailed analysis of what we do with those things. I'll show you something a little. On the left side, you see a nanoparticle where I have used a fluorescent compound glucose to show that indeed I was able to recognize that. On the right side, no, no, uh, no glucose. Why am I doing those things? At some point, you have to talk to people that don't have the background that you have. Just going in there and talking about molecular recognition and mimetics and so on will not give you anything. You need to have some visuals. Visuals have become very important. All those of you who work on materials in chemistry, open all the major journals, starting from the ACS journals, the MRS journals, the RSC journals, nature, science, and so on. What's the first thing now? It's the pictures. It's the diagrams. To the point that sometimes you get upset. I don't know about you, I get upset. I say, come on now. You're trying to sell me your idea with a nice diagram? But the important thing is the diagram gives a first approximation of what happens in a system. Now, we did that. Can you do that for larger molecules? In this case, it was a case of glucose. And the answer is, we have been able to do it for larger molecules. And you see here something with lysozyme where we are able to recognize lysozyme in what we call MIP, molecularly imprinted material, versus a non-MIP, non-molecularly imprinted material. At which point, somebody comes to me and says, one of my graduate students, and they are really, I mean, it's magnificent to be attracting to your group people that are better than you, period. And to be sitting there and saying, John, you're right, I was wrong, okay? So one of the students came to me and said, can we recognize three things together? Why? That would be better. Because we can have one sensing technique, a material that will recognize those three things together. So we start coming now with structures that have imprinted three different compounds together. And as you can see on the left side of this diagram, we are able to do that. And there were several students, Heidi Calver and of course John Clegg, and more recently, Drew Murphy, whose picture I show you here, who started doing that. And one day, Heidi comes to me and says, there is an application where you can use that. What's the application? Sjögren's syndrome. That's a very nice Swedish name. Who was this guy? Somebody who discovered that in young girls and ladies at 15 years old, they develop um, dry, dry, dry mouth. So what do the parents say? Oh, drink some water. Drink some more water. And then dry eyes. What do the parents say? Take some visine. Take some more visine. And you see what the problem is. None of us is, not none of us, most of us are not serious enough to say, wait a minute, there may be a disease here. Let's examine it very carefully. The disease is Sjögren syndrome. And there are certain characteristics that we try to recognize, and indeed, with Drew Murphy that you see here on the right, and we others, we are able to recognize three compounds now together in order to be able to, uh, uh, to, 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 to use them basically by, as a biosensor, as a very fast biosensor. Uh, and you can see here the ability to recognize even a larger molecule. This is a lot of new work has been done in various levels, not all of it in humans, some of it in animal studies, but it is a lot of work that we continue trying to do in my laboratory. So we have now the ability now to have increase of the absorption of certain types of components. In our case, the three biomarkers that are characteristic of this disease, of Schergen disease. And Duke Murphy is giving a very nice presentation. And Marsha Moses from Harvard, major professor, the Judah Folkman professor at Harvard says, 
sir, why did you need one compound to do all these three together? We can do each one of them separately. And Andrew responds in a magnificent way to talk about how this is so much better for the patient. You don't have the patient for several hours in the laboratory taking samples and samples again and so on. Now, there is a next step. I, there is no way for me to tell you all the things I would like to tell you. Probably you would have to be here for a day. But there is another thing that we can do with these structures. We can create now nanoparticles or bigger particles that have the ability to have in them certain characteristics, like recognition of lipids or recognition of other hydrophilic compounds, and very often cavities that can be used for what? For regenerative medicine. And already before I started talking, I had several people who came to me and they said they were interested in tissue engineering. Come up with new scaffolds that have the ability to recognize a particular cell, a particular set of cells that you are going to be able to use in order to grow the new tissue. It's not really that difficult. It requires, of course, two or three years of work, but it is something that could be done. And indeed, we have come up with such scaffolds. And one of those scaffolds has been one in which we work with a very, very unusual material. The student is Maria David, and you will see her picture in a minute. You know, we were having a party in my house, in the back of the house. And I was looking at something that we have in the house called pyracanths or pyracanths, which is this greenish that has these little berries, these little berries, you've seen it. And I started talking, I told Maria, and I said, why can't we do a structure like this that will have a major network that slowly dissolves, biodegrades, and it leaves the little nano berries, as I call them, we still call them that way, that release a larger molecule. So you have a dual release, change in the conditions using a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic system, and you come up now with a new scaffold for tissue engineering. And we worked with Maria and also with a young lady that you see on the very right in the bottom uh, who came to us from Switzerland to work on this subject. And we are able to create structures now that under certain conditions, the third system, give you the best possible release. An early release and a later release. Uh, this is Maria David. She has become now a, a wonderful scientist for the company Alcon. It's the company that makes the intraocular lenses. Intraocular lenses, for what? For cataracts. Why would a material scientist be interested in it? Of course you would be interested in it. You are going to replace the lens of somebody who doesn't see anymore with a better lens. But how do we do that in the eye? The doctor goes and does a very small incision takes out the old lens by a process that is known as lithotripsy and puts the new lens, usually in the form of a little cigar, and then it opens up, it goes on that side, you cover the eye, a few hours later you go back, and in most cases the patient can see again. Cataract has been solved. And this is really what Alcon and many other companies are doing right now. Ladies and gentlemen, 25 years ago, I was in Fort Worth in some of the early human studies at the company Alcon, where we did the first test. And after that, uh, the next day, because at that time it was taking two days for the, for the, for the, for the, for the patients to come in, the, the patient came up, closed the room. It was a room about an eighth of this one, dark. They removed the bandage. And we hear this 72-year-old lady, oh my God, I can see again. She had been able to see with a new lens, replacing the old lens, and you know something, without glasses, because in many cases, you go back to 20 years. And everybody in the audience was in tears, the doctors, myself, 
And then somebody says, and the inventor is here. And she goes around and comes to the inventor, myself, I was 25 years younger, and says, my boy, you saved my life. I can see again my granddaughter. I can follow her when she goes to get married. And everybody starts crying. And that moment, you realize why you, why we as material scientists try to solve important problems for the world. Not for the publications, not for the awards, not for the citations. Who cares? The patient doesn't care about your citations. The patient cares that she can see again. And she has 10 more meaningful years of life. So again, to the graduate students, I leave that to you as a, as a goal of something you have to do in your life. Now, um, the idea of nanotechnology in materials is not a new one. We were one of the earliest ones who were working on it. You would see this book, which is basically nanotechnology pharmaceutical applications about 15 years ago. Both of the co-authors of this book Zach Hill and, uh, and uh, John Thomas have done very well, one in academia, the other one in industry. The book is available, by the way, you can see it in Google, 90% of the book you can cover it now, Pete. One characteristic of the book is this idea of intelligence. Please do me two minutes, give me two minutes of your time. We say the systems are intelligent. And you know, we work seriously, and we have people saying, oh yeah, you, were, you use the word smart because you want to get money from NIH or from NSF. No, we don't use it because we want to get money from NIH and NSF. We say that these nanoparticles that have a cross-link structure, that have certain tethers and so on, have a thermodynamic interaction with the surrounding environment. That thermodynamic interaction may sometimes be simply a swelling because of a pH sensitivity. It may be a temperature effect. It may be an interaction with a particular compound, with a protein, with a peptide, and so on. So we are talking clearly about the thermodynamic interaction. And over the past several years, I still haven't finished that crazy book, but this is gonna be one of the last things in my life. It's now due to come out in 2024. It's basically a book in which I teach what we mean by thermodynamic response to external, uh, to external in inputs and so on. Uh, and there, of course, you see all the things you already understand when you have a network, a structure, a polymer, a soft matter that happens to have in it tethers of uh, hydrophilic compounds or pH sensitive compounds or temperature sensitive compounds, you're going to have different response. And of course, we try to do that with molecular recognition, also with all the difficulties that we may have. We are not successful with everything, but we try to do it in the presence of blood, in the presence of hydrogen bonds, and so on. So the idea of stimuli responsive hydrogels is something very important and all of you have heard about it and you know now that we can use stimuli for the body in order to take a gel, a hydrogel, a network and modify it so that what? The open structure can open up and allow the delivery, the treatment of a particular disease. One particular application will be in our being able to give those interferon betas that we were talking about in multiple sclerosis, to give them to the patients without injections, but rather with a simple capsule that the patient will take and will go in the stomach, will bypass the stomach, arrive in the upper small intestine, and in the upper small intestine it will go and open up tight junctions, go in between tight junctions, I don't know. I would prefer that it goes really through the cells by endocytosis and coming up to the other side. And this is something we have been doing for 15 years. And I can tell you, you cannot do this work without having 
first-rate people. And so I'm going to go a little bit fast here because we don't have time. And I may come back to that and show you first one application where we take the protein, we interact it with now a chaperon. This is transferrin. And look what happens. The system in the stomach does not open up, does not release nothing. But you go in the upper small intestine, it arrives in the upper small intestine, look what it does. It's still conjugate, but it starts penetrating through. And as it penetrates, it goes through by endocytosis, gets into the other side, and it is decomplexed, and you have the protein in the blood. This is the way we are doing now for certain drugs, insulin predominantly, but a few others as well, in order to deliver them to the body. As I tell you all these things, and I know that many of you are really very excited and you hear those things and probably you go back to see the papers. This is just the beginning of the iceberg. Each one of these experiments requires that you do the studies with an animal under the appropriate conditions and so on. But you are able to see now that you can deliver, for example, an insulin in the presence of this compound at what is it? It goes from 1 to 24, 24 times faster. That's the slope. And those of you who are chemical engineers, you will recognize that the experiment you do is nothing else than a transport experiment. But that's the on, not the only disease. Of course, insulin was probably the first success. And now come the difficult things. And now is the time that I have to recognize my group. Some of them are here. And when we finish tonight, you can see them in the, <laughs> in the reception and you approach them and talk to them. And you were surprised. Many of them are what we call on the other side of the border, Hispanics. They were born in Mexico or in Colombia and so on. So here are three of them. Olivia. Olivia is not born in Mexico. <laughs> Fabiola, who is from Reynosa. Fabiola Chapa Villarreal. And she is uh, a graduate of Tecnológico de Monterrey, and she is in the third year. And the other is Jesus, Jesus Rodriguez, who is a graduate of Texas A&M. We don't. We don't say anything bad about that but he's originally also from Mexico. And what they are doing is they are working now on a set of other diseases that are more difficult to study. You see on the lower left side, you see the multiple sclerosis. And we are working with interferon beta and so on. On the upper left side, rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis is not just a simple arthritis. Fabiola Chapa Villarreal works on that. Actually, she's preparing a very nice paper right now. And you will see it in a very little while. It's basically a disease which is treated usually with Humira. How do you deliver Humira? Do you know what they do? They have big injections in the stomach. Straight down the stomach. Are you kidding me? That's not a solution. Abvi may be making money, but, but that's not the solution for the patient. So we're trying to see if oral delivery would work. The one on the lower right side is Jesus' work, and it is macular degeneration. When Jesus moved to Texas, he came to me, he says, I want to work on this subject. And he has done an absolutely incredible job, not only in developing new ways of treating macular degeneration, but at the same time looking at all other aspects of ocular therapy. Olivia is the person in charge of siRNA delivery. SIRNA delivery is very important because you treat a very large number of autoimmune diseases. And these are the various compounds with which you treat them. Look at them in all cases, Humira, uh, Lucentis, uh, of course, interferon beta, salmon calcitonin. These are large molecules. You cannot just open your mouth and put some salmon calcitonin and think it's going to go in the stomach. You need to use the carrier. The carrier is the nanoparticles. They have to be of a certain structure, and they have to deliver something in the proper way. And you know something else? Some of these, uh, some of these proteins have high isoelectric points. High isoelectric points, 7.4, 8, 8 and 4, 
are very difficult to deliver. And yet, we have been able to deliver them with new types of carriers based on itaconic acid and other compounds. And this is an important field. So it's an important field for translation. Look at this table, if you can see it from far away. It has on the left side different therapeutic agents, and then the companies, and then the markets. But also look at the PI, the isoelectric point. So you can see that we have here situations where we can deliver Humira, or we are working on delivering Humira, which is a huge market. Will companies be interested in an oral delivery system? I think they will. Because eventually they will realize that the patient does not suffer as much as they will suffer in uh, the case of, a, of an injection. Why should we all be interested in that? Because we are material scientists. Because we have now Humira, which is an ant antibody that we are trying to release through a network that has to be always the same. Errors are not allowed in the biomedical field. You cannot say, I succeeded in 99.9% .9 of the cases, but I lost five patients. You have no problem, your program, uh, no, no solution. Your company is closed. You got it? It has to be a perfect solution. And yes, there are perfect solutions. I don't know if this group has heard Bob Langer. Bob Langer and I were classmates at MIT. We took different directions. Magnificent, he's probably the most well-known biomedical engineer in the world. He hasn't gotten a Nobel Prize, but he has gotten everything else. And if you look at what he has done and what he does by really examining materials, then you are very proud that you are a material scientist. Paula Hammond who is the chairman of the chemical engineering department at MIT. Paula Hammond, younger, only about 55 years old, she has done magnificent work on self-assembled structures and so on. So there is much more we can do in this area. Now, I am going to jump. These are some of the selected proteins we are working on. Some on calcitonin for treatment of postmenopausal women, uh, uh, osteoporosis, uh, urokinase for thrombosis, and of course, Retoxan for a variety of different other applications. Interferons are very important for me, especially interferon beta. Uh, they are very, very expensive. So there we have a problem how to do all the studies. But I have several students who are trying to see how these 20,000 Dalton mat materials can be delivered. I am running a little bit behind, and I want to show you something else if I can. So, uh, and it's this diagram, interferon beta. I told you that when I discovered that I was multiple sclerotic, by mistake, I started working on it. And the company that came to my help was Tori Industries in Japan. And together we developed a new system for delivery orally of interferon beta. And you can see the results in the very last picture, the very last diagram, the last on the right as you look at it. Look at the concentration of interferon beta in the animal after it has been admitted orally. And you can see you have a high, con high concentration. These are ELISA studies. This is not just concentration. And you take the area under the peak, and that tells you the real protein that is delivered in the blood. And we see this data, and every time I present it, it has been 15 years now, every time I present it, I feel goosebumps. And of course, the first answer is all of us, oh, we solved the problem of multiple sclerosis. It's many more things before you solve it. But it gives you a hope that someday people will be able not to have any more injections for these difficult things, but using a nanoparticulate system that has been designed with a balance of hydrophilic, hydrophobic interactions and cross-linking of a certain type, they will be able to deliver in the blood of the animal and provide the interferon beta that is needed. And here comes my next slide. As you can imagine, I'm in love with my students. 
Ah. This is Isabella and Jesus and Maria and uh, Fabiola and Olivia. You're going to see here in the audience Jesus, Olivia, and Fabiola. Isabella at this very moment is giving a seminar at the American Chemical Society in San, Anto in San Francisco. And she's speaking immediately after Caroline Bertozzi, so, who is a Nobel laureate of last year. So we are all giving her a hard time how she can do that, and is there any pressure that she will speak, but she will do a marvelous job. But you can see Isabella is much more in the tight junctions. Jesus is in the macular degeneration. Maria is in these two component complex systems. Fabiola is, of course, in various self-assembled structures based on black polymers, and Olivia is on the siRNA delivery for treatment of Crohn's disease and IBD. I know I'm telling you only the very tip of the iceberg, okay? Uh, and I wish I had the time. I have another talk on Wednesday at 4.30 in which I will talk very specifically about molecular theories of networks. Uh, we are organizing a very nice symposium. It's organized by Marisa uh, Ruben Morones, who is a former student of mine. He's at uh, Nuevo Leon, uh, Fabiola, and myself. And it's on Wednesday, the whole day, on hydrogels. We have 34 papers, and we hope we will have fun in that meeting as well. So it says five minutes here. I wanted to close with one last thing. Delivery of siRNA, small interference RNA. Magnificent system for treating a number of diseases. Very difficult delivery. Those of you who have started being tired, you know why? Because it cannot be delivered just in the stomach. It has to be delivered in the cells. So I submit to you, how do you come up with a cross-linked polymer that is intact here it goes to the stomach, bypasses the stomach, it goes to the intestine, and delivers now what? SIRNA. Oh, so it has to be cationic. It's a cationic, but it delivers a SIRNA. And what is the SIRNA? It's in the upper small intestine with partially digested food and so on, and it has to pass through the cells. And we have been able to do it. And this is, oh, by the way, this whole idea came very important 15 years ago when uh, Fire and Mellow in 2006 got the Nobel Prize on siRNA. And you have to understand, a Nobel Prize is an incredible way for you to continue supporting work for patients that you have forgotten. I believe, for example, that Carolyn Bertozzi's work last year is making us, everybody working on click chemistry right now, although there were many people who were working on it. Or, of course, Francis Arnold's work two years ago, which gives us the opportunity to re-examine uh, direct evolution, okay? And I will stop here and make a comment dear to my heart. These are all women. And, of course, Emmanuel Charpentier and many others. These are women who suffered. Some of them had children. Some of them had family, tragic events in their families. But they were able to become the leaders in the field. And I'm so glad that we give the opportunity to so many women to really have their career and their life at the same time. So anyhow, to conclude, this is what we did. We are able to go directly into the cells and deliver the siRNA in the cell. This is the work of Olivia Lanier, who absolutely loves to talk about it all the time. Talk to her tonight. And basically what she has done is what you see here, a system which is a macrogel. It's anionic. It goes in the upper small intestine. It opens up because it's anionic, pH allowed. And it releases now what? Nanogels of the cationic system. And these nanogels penetrate through the cells. And if you don't believe me, look at this diagram here. 
Uh, there, there were some nice slides about Argit technology for developing those things. We don't have time today, but, but I wanted to show, look, look at this diagram. This is confocal microscopy. A nice way to convince everybody. You are able to use three different dyes, and you can see the particles, green. You can see the cell membrane, red. And you can see the membrane, blue. And you can see that you have the ability to pass the particles in the system. I know I tired you. It says that I have one minute and 19 seconds. I don't like to do that. Uh, I want to close with two remarks. This was a materials talk, but we never delved into all the materials, the cross-link structures and so on. More, more, more of that on Wednesday. But it is a talk about research in life about convergence, about helping patients, about doing something little. And you know, my dean of medicine says, Nicholas, don't come in and tell us what you can solve. No. You go and you listen to the medical doctors. What are your problems? And they tell you what their problems are. And then you sit down and you work on it. And this is what we're doing right now with my students, with Olivia Lanier and many others. We have every second or third Friday a meeting with the pediatrics department where we listen to their problems and we try to give solutions. Also, I want to pay, to pay a special, give a special mention to Olivia for another reason. Olivia strongly believes in health disparities. She believes there are certain diseases, and she can prove it, where, where you were born, how you were raised, up in the mountains north of Guadalajara where there is absolutely nothing else and how that has affected what you suffer, what has happened to you. And she's trying to develop now systems for a more equitable delivery of, uh, of uh, health, of, uh, of, of improved treatments and so on in everybody, especially in women and what we call in the United States minorities. This is the group. I want to thank all of them. And I want to thank you for your attention. And as always, I would be, be glad to talk to you for hours. Good night, doctor. Thank you for the presentation. Um, in terms of biosensing, uh, how is the effectivity of these cross-linking and hydrogels to maintain the pH and the temperature of enzyme or any other bioreceptor inside the capsule so they maintain the high uh, effectiveness to recognize any molecule or any analyte in the case that they maintain a very good, um, well, stability with the pH of the stomach and the digestive system. This is a very, very important question, and I hope you understood what your colleague asked, because as I said earlier, we work in the laboratory with a simple system in water, in deionized water. Yes, we can recognize or we can do biosensing, but can you do the same biosensing in the presence of other competing processes? The fact that at the same time there are some competing systems. And I think he gave already one of the possible answers that we have followed, which is to encapsulate a, bio, a biosensing system exactly to avoid this interaction with the other components, but in specific cases. The problem is when you develop a technique and you show it to industry, either they will give you more money or they will say we are not interested because it's too difficult. So that's why we have also our own companies that we started ourselves. But it's a very good question and I think you gave partially the answer. <laughs> other questions? No. I tired you, eh? I know. 
<laughs> there is a there is a reception coming up. Am I right? Where is Zach? Zach? There's a question in the back. Ah, okay. We have Yes. Uh, good night. Um, what's your uh, opinion or perspective about the Theranostic systems? Uh, because the Theranostics uh, combine many of the aspects uh, that you talk it, uh, in, in, in your presentation. Thank you. I want to say to the rest of the audience, I did not put these two gentlemen, I did not give them the questions to ask. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's a wonderful paper about a few years ago by myself and some of my students in the uh, accounts of chemical research, which has the answers to the aeronautic systems. And we have worked as much as we can. The group is not as large as it used to be. We used to be at 50 people, now we are down to what, 15. But uh, my view is yes, I think we can come up with systems that have the ability not only to recognize a particular chemical, but to do an actual ther theranostic action. Uh, Miguel, if I may, I want to finish that question. You remember the story of multiple sclerosis? I always thought, yeah, delivering the interferon is not the only solution. How exactly is multiple sclerosis appearing? And I discovered that there is a protein appearing called osteopontin. And I said, ha ha, we are going to be measuring osteopontin by biosensing in the brain and telling the doctor the osteopontin is high. That means having a barrier with a blood brain barrier, which is another huge problem. So your question, absolutely, we need to do much more in that area, but I, I don't think I'm the expert on it. But we do consider such uh, processes. Thank you. Well, well, I really suggest that you approach uh, Professor Pepas. He's uh, absolutely willing to talk. I'm sure some of you are shy to ask public, but please approach him. And, and I would like to give him uh, another thank for this fantastic talk. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will meet in the toast in the garden of the of the, the hotel. I don't know this year where is it, but I think it's in this hotel. <laughs> <laughs>